couple of years ago, I was visiting in a coastal town, and an old gentleman that I was talking to made a point that I'd never really thought about before. People spend a lot of money to come to Maine for two weeks in the summer, and we get to live here year-round. I think often we don't appreciate our immediate surroundings enough, and in Maine, that's doubly true. We live in what is truly one of the special places on this entire planet, and often we don't notice it. Sometimes you need to get a special perspective to be aware of what it is that you're seeing and hearing and feeling and experiencing. In the film that you're about to see, you're going to get a unique perspective on Maine, uh, one that I've been fortunate enough to see as I travel the state, both on the ground and in the air. But I hope that it will give you the same feeling it gives me of affection and emotion about this very special place. It'll make you, I think, high on Maine. I'm Jack Perkins. We humans, so much of the time, are so limited. We stand five or six feet tall, so it is mostly just from that elevation that we perceive the world around us. Consequently, the towering trees, the primeval forests of Maine, its majestic hills and granite mountains, we know mostly from looking up at them. Sometimes, while looking up, we see an eagle and envy. How magical would it be, we think, to soar like that, for a change to look down upon this beautiful land. So we try. We drive up Mount Batty or Cadillac. We hike to the top of Katahdin or Bigelow or the South Bubble. And from vantage points like these, we gaze down, relishing for a moment the novelty. But we are still not the eagle. We are fixed on our peak. We cannot soar. Well, for the next few moments together, we shall soar. With cameras clamped to the belly of a helicopter, with a pilot both adroit and courageous, we will have our eagle's wings. Believe me, if you love Maine looking up at it from below, wait till you see it looking down from on high.
only state bordered by only one other. We're flying over New Hampshire, looking into Maine from the west. Or from the south, the Isles of Shoals. This one belongs to New Hampshire. The one next belongs to Maine, and the line has oft been disputed. In the state's most northerly reaches, towns like Fort Kent, Madawaska, nudge hard into neighboring Canada, only the St. John River describing the boundary between. And to the east, no town in America farther east than Lubeck. North, east, west, and south. We're gonna cover this state as it has never been covered before. As we gaze down, let us remember we are seeing more than geography and topography. We are seeing, if we look not just with our eyes, but with our hearts, something of the essence of this state. This is a special place, and what we see looking down are the symbols of Maine's specialness. And what better symbol? No state in the Union is more heavily forested than Maine. From up here, it's not hard to believe the statistic. 90% of our lands are covered with woods. This is the pine tree state, but it is much more than pines. Hardwoods and soft, deciduous, coniferous, the canopy we can see from here, the undergrowth we can't. It was the tall straight pines good for ship masts that first attracted tree hunters to this place. But today, loggers don't seek ship masts, aren't looking as much for lumber as for pulp and paper. Those are the products for which the main woods today are mostly harvested. Fly over a patch that has recently been clear-cut and we are reminded we don't all agree on how our woods should be handled. Some despair that we shouldn't be cutting so many trees. Others say there are probably more trees today than when the despairing began. It is a bountiful place, the Maine woods, an incredibly expansive reach of lore and love and mystery. No spread of forest in our country is better known, more admired or desired. And none has both molded and mirrored the character of its people like the sturdy, stalwart Maine woods. Now, if 90% of Maine's land is wooded, one can quickly figure that doesn't leave much room for cities. But then most Mainers don't want to live in cities. Most Mainers prefer the life of the small town. Or the life of no town at all. Almost half the state, nobody ever got around to organizing anything like a town. Why bother? About half of Maine is officially overseen by the state as unorganized townships or plantations. Nothing else like it in America. Another symbol of the specialness of this state and its people. Oh, we do have a few cities. 
but only 22. The largest, of course, is Portland, with South Portland and Westbrook, its neighbors, about 100,000 people. On the other hand, Eastport has 2,000, but it's a city. As you look at the cities of this state, you realize it's not size that distinguishes city from town. The smallest town, should it choose, can ask the legislature and be made a city. Cities of all sizes, except big. Maine doesn't have big cities. And for most Mainers, that's just fine. Looking down on our cities and towns reminds us of one shaping truth of our lives. We like to live by water. We choose to, almost need to. We started, of course, by the ocean. That is what brought our forebears here from old lands in old days. And still today, our ocean frontage intrigues us. Travel writers call it the rock-bound coast. Scientists refer to it as a battered coast, a drowned coast. Well, whatever it's called, the statistic that leaves some people stunned, if not incredulous, is that this meandering coast of Maine is 3,500 miles long. Half the tidal line of the U.S. East Coast is right here. How, some wonder, can that be? Well, these meanders are for them.
inescapable as you fly this coast, the myriad of islands. Nowhere in America more than here. How many? Well, how do you count? At low tide, these two islands are one. At high tide, there are other islands that completely disappear, covered over by water. So how do you count? And why do you want to bother? There are tall, wooded islands with abundant life. There are islands of different colors. There are a lot of islands. Thousands of islands scattered across the waters, said an early observer, like jewels strewn by the gods. This island is named Jewel. As legend has it, this is where Captain Kidd stashed his pirate's loot. Other islands served nobler purposes, but are no less storied, for from them shone the lamps which saved many a mariner.
Some islands were meant to protect in other ways, from wars which mercifully never reached them. But today on islands and coast, we are left with so many forlorn, futile forts. We said earlier that 90% of Maine's land is forested. Well, we should be more precise. That's 90% of Maine's dry land. In fact, 10% of the state is underwater. First, there are the rivers that carried our forebears inland, which hauled their freight, on which they built their mills. Yes, that song apparently was inspired by an old mill stream in Maine. There are 38,000 miles of rivers and streams in Maine. The state's longest river, 331 miles, the St. John. Not far behind in length, the great Penobscot. The Androscoggin. The Kennebec. Sometimes these great rivers run broad and smooth. Sometimes, so eager to be where they're going, they rush and tumble, frolic and fall. energy shouldn't be wasted. It isn't. With dams and their turbines, our rivers and streams 
and gather our homes at their banks. Hard to think of many towns in Maine that aren't along ocean, or rivers, or streams, or lakes. Let us not forget the lakes and ponds of Maine. More than 2,500 of them. A million acres worth. Some we drink. Some we fish. Many we sail, row, paddle, swim. Estimable bodies of water with wonderful names like Sebago, Moose look McGuntic. Richardson is actually three lakes which used to be called Wellokenabakuk, Aldabendabagog, and Molachunkamunk. Who says Indian languages weren't fun? And the biggest of all, the magnificent Moosehead, with all its islands, with Mount Kineo and the classic old resort, a lake 40 miles long, biggest freshwater lake contained in any state, and by far the most beautiful.
Moosehead Lake lies in Piscataquis County, the most sparsely populated part of Maine. Average only five people per square mile. Mainers don't like being too crowded. So most of us today still live in small towns with one thing in common from town to town. Maybe because we are overhead looking down, it is more apparent. But every town every community we see seems clustered as though in fervent devotion around a steeple. There may be a general store in town, a convenience store perhaps, maybe even a fast food place or two, but from up here, those are not noticed. From up here, you see the steeple. It's as though wherever people have gathered, each town, each village, each crossroads, inexorably they have raised a spire. Aspire to inspire? A steeple to reach toward the unreachable, the ineffable. The other aspect of towns that we cannot ignore from up here, the cemetery, its ancient stones telling more of the past than most of us in the present ever take time to notice. And of course, surrounding our towns, 
those fertile fields of labor where men and women, as though heedless of the shortness of seasons, the harshness of climate, find ever more efficient ways to turn the land, to turn the crops. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes even turn a profit. The foremost fruits of our farmers' toil, eggs and poultry, blueberries, dairy, apples. And of course, potatoes. Potatoes used to rule Aroostook, the largest of Maine counties, proud to be called simply the county. Today, potatoes share that throne with broccoli, even flax, crops that yield some colorful geometry. Color and pattern are the two amazing abstractions by which you are struck flying over this state. Patterns made by people or nature. Colors so vivid they almost overload the senses. All of this beauty, it's hard to pick the ultimate symbols of this state's specialness. We know how much land and how few people we have, average 15 acres of land per person, a rare legacy. But the test is, what do we do with that legacy? Here are the two symbols. The first is on Mount Desert Island. Here are unique lands, formed by fire, sculpted by ice, garbed in green, refreshed by water. 
a singular paradise. But years ago, it became apparent that these unique lands would inevitably be swallowed by growth, progress, development. And it was then that far-seeing and generous people acted to forestall that. They purchased these lands, and then in turn they donated these lands to the people of this nation. Acadia National Park, forever preserved. The second symbol is up in the far reaches of the Maine wilds, lands which another prophetic benefactor, the one-time governor of this state, Percival Baxter, bought with his own money, since government would not help. He made a latter life's career of buying to protect this wilderness. Katahdin. Today, from the heart of Baxter State Park, the summit of that state's highest mountain and greatest symbol, it is said one can see more land and lakes than from any peak in the country. On top, there's a bronze plaque with Percival Baxter's words. Katahdin stands above the surrounding plain unique in grandeur and glory. The works of man are short-lived Monuments decay, buildings crumble, and wealth vanishes. But Katahdin, in its massive grandeur, will forever remain the mountain of the people of Maine. And so it will, thanks to him. So what do the two symbols, Acadia and Katahdin, remind us about our state? That there is unsurpassed beauty here. And there are those who appreciate it and are determined, whatever it takes, to safeguard and perpetuate it. There is 
a special dedication for a very special place. It is sometimes said that Maine is where the sun first rises on America each day. Well, maybe the way to close this is by noting that it could also be said it's the first place where the sun sets. And that's not a bad thing either. <laughs>